So can you tell us a little bit maybe about yourself and your inspiration to run for the state assembly? Sure. Uh, you know, first and foremost, I want to say uh, you guys are all impeccably dressed. I apologize. I'm wearing a T-shirt and everyone here, including Edwin, is wearing a suit and tie. So I may a copa, uh, but you guys are great. You know, so you guys are immediately hired for whatever job you guys are interviewing for. So kudos to you. Um, well, you know, I am unlike uh, the folks on the Zoom call because you guys are outstanding. Uh, I know based on the backgrounds I hear about you and also being high school students at Walnut High School, how competitive it is at Walnut High School. Um, I myself, uh, the only thing that I was good at was probably getting kicked out of high school. And so I got kicked out of high school and it wasn't until I had an opportunity to go to a high school in which um, I was uh, being fostered by many um, parents in the high school institution, teachers, principals, my mom, that um, I really was able to succeed and do better, so to speak. I wouldn't say succeed, but do better. <clears throat> so while you guys were talking about all these college institutions, um, which UC you want to go to, MIT with Ashton, you know, uh, UC Berkeley uh, for some of you, and of course, everyone has impeccable grades. <clears throat> I didn't know if I'd go to a four-year college. So for most of you guys, it's which UC you guys want to go to or which Ivy League. I really thought I was going to either go to the workforce or uh, join the military or possibly go to a two-year community college because my grades didn't hack in. And as I said before, I was kicked out um, of high school, uh, but I kind of got my act together and through the love and support of my mom, especially, um, I was able to get into a four-year university and I was so happy. I mean, if you told your parents you're going to a Cal State, they probably wouldn't be that happy. But I got a Cal State Fullerton and I was ecstatic. I mean, it was that, oh God, I got a chance to go to a four-year university and have a semblance of college life. I know it's um, probably a big punishment to you guys if you went to a Cal State, but for me, I was ecstatic. And for the folks in this room, probably especially Ashton, you know, having an API background, you want to bring honor to your family. And when I was a freshman in college, I wanted to bring honor to my family. And what better way to bring honor to your family? Because if you're of Asian American descent, they say you can be three occupations. You can be a doctor, you can be an attorney, and you can be an engineer. Right? So I wanted to be a doctor. So I was a bio major and um, I hated it. <laughs> I took bio classes. I did not enjoy it. But I took it anyways, because I wanted to be a doctor. And during my freshman year, and Edwin can probably appreciate this because he's in a fraternity as well. I joined a fraternity, but I didn't join a fraternity, Sigma Nu, because I wanted to go and necessarily socialize or party. There was two folks in the fraternity that were in government, in politics, student government. And one was Heath Rothman, he was student body president at Cal State Fullerton. The other is Christian Nisoro. And from there, I fell in love with student government. I got involved in the fraternity and they were known for mentoring the next generation of student body presidents. And they would kind of pass the baton, so to speak. So one person would run, they would teach him how to run for office. The quote unquote special interest groups that you need to meet in a college institution and how much money you need to raise. And uh, I got involved through there. So I ran for student body president, I won. I was the first uh, Taiwanese American to win at Cal State Fullerton and that completely changed my trajectory. So from there, I um, went into graduate school at USC. So I <clears throat> started studying a, a bit more and focusing more on my academics. Uh, got into the public administration school at USC and um, MPA school, and that's the you know, top five in the nation. And I was very, very happy. Um, they always say, um, or some of my mentors will tell me, always be the dumbest person in the room so you can learn from everyone else. And make no mistake, I was the dumbest person in the room because everyone else in my classes were way smarter than me, had way more experience in the workforce <clears throat> and you know some of these guys they graduated from Harvard and from undergrad or Yale and they and they go to USC for their graduate school and I just was lucky to be there and I loved it I really enjoyed it it was a good intersection between 
theory and practice. <clears throat> and I knew this is the area I wanted to focus on, to focus on public policy and government. So I um, applied for the doctorate program at USC, uh, got in to the School of uh, Education and started uh, going to classes. But I didn't want to just teach. Um, I was teaching at night at Cal State Fullerton. Um, and during the days, I would go to class. And I wanted to get into the practical application of it. So I applied for 100 jobs, uh, trying to learn about public policy and politics. And from those 100 jobs, and this is someone who's already got an undergrad degree, or received a master's degree, um, is getting his doctorate and was teaching as an adjunct professor at Cal State Fullerton. And from those 100 jobs, 98 of them rejected me. Only two came back and were like, hey, Phil, I want you to interview. And even those two, I didn't get a job. <laughs> so it was a real blow to my ego. Um, and it taught me the importance to embracing the struggle. So when you uh, go out there and uh, graduate from high school and go into college, you're going to meet a lot of adversity. And that is OK. Um, adversity, uh, in fact, is the only way you're going to learn. You know, oftentimes we put our lives into two categories, su success and failure. But the irony is um, you won't do well, and there's some lessons you won't learn unless you fail. You have to fail. You have to go through uh, trials and tribulations. One can see farther through a tear than a telescope. And these lessons you cannot learn in a book. You have to learn through failure. You know, so I commend you for um, having this leadership project at Walnut. And I hope you continue to go out and go beyond the four corners of your classroom to continue to search out for things that are beyond your reach because you're gonna fail and it's okay. In this world that it's so pleasure seeking and pain avoidance, you have to lean into the punch and embrace the struggle. So um, what I did was I went back to the drawing board <clears throat> And uh, I said, uh, what can I do better to find a job? Well, you know, instead of me uh, becoming a piece of paper uh, and people don't really know me, I was like, why don't I do internships? So I went to a bunch of job fairs. I went to a job fair at USC and lo and behold, I saw an internship position available. And the internship said, LA County Supervisor Mike Antonovich. And no one, certainly I didn't know what a supervisor did but I went to do some research and I applied. And the intern coordinator at the time was a person named Lita Erickson. And they said, Phil, you're overqualified, overqualified, right? It's just more like a, another nice way to say, we don't wanna hire you. You're overqualified. You have a master's degree. You have a college degree. You're getting your doctorate. Uh, as an intern, you're getting paid like eight bucks an hour. You're gonna be fetching coffee and donuts and doing the grunt work. And if you're lucky for constituents that die in our district, you get to write their adjourn in memory, which is kind of like their obituary, right? <clears throat> and I said, no problem, it's okay. I just want an opportunity for me to introduce myself, for you to get to know who I am and what I'm about. And hopefully maybe later on, I can be put into a position of responsibility. And she said, that's unlikely. It's unlikely because the LA County Board of Supervisors, they govern, the 14th largest economy in the world. Their budget is $30 billion. Uh, they have a staff of 50 plus, the highest paid staffer got paid over a quarter million dollars, which is unheard of, and Edwin knows this, <laughs> in the political world, they're all elected officials. I mean, in my personal opinion, um, if you are interested in politics, they are the best position to be in. LA County Board of Supervisors, elected body, uh, in the world. I think it's better than being a congressman. I think it's better than being an assembly member. I actually think it's better than being the governor. That's my personal opinion because they hold a tremendous amount of power. And there's 39 departments in LA County. Um, of these 39, uh, 36 of them are appointed by the five board of supervisors. The other three that are elected are in LA County and are the district attorney, the sheriff, and the assessor. And all these other 36 departments <clears throat> have huge amounts of responsibility. The health department, the mental health department, the homeless division, the um, 
social services, uh, children family services, uh, fire department, uh, all these departments, they do more for your day-to-day -day than the president of the United States. So in Walnut, where you guys reside, <clears throat> you guys have the Walnut Sheriff's Department. Well, you don't have your own police department. Like LAPD has the Los Angeles Police Department. Walnut has a Sheriff's Department because the Sheriff's Department, which is run by LA County, they contract with more than 88 cities, more than half of the 88 cities in LA County. So in LA County, it's a region that has 88 cities in 134 unincorporated areas. So an unincorporated area would be like Roland Heights, uh, Hacienda Heights, Acton Aquidulce. These are areas that have yet to become a city. So the five board of supervisors are like their city council, but over half of the 88 cities that are incorporated like Walnut, which is a city, they contract with LA County. So lo and behold, um, they said, okay, Phil, we'll give you a shot. So they hired me and I was an intern and I was doing what they said they would be doing as an intern. I would be fetching coffee, I fetch coffee. I'd be buying donuts, I bought donuts. And I also got a chance to write obituaries. But lo and behold, as time went on, I was there five days a week, uh, eight, at least eight hours a day, including going to class and teaching at night. <clears throat> they got a chance to know me and they gave me more responsibility. So I started doing legislation. I started doing policy. And it's funny. Um, they often say success is when oppor opportunity meets hard work and the more uh, you work, the harder that you work, um, the luckier you get. Well, the health deputy position opened up. Usually the staffers for the board of supervisors, they don't leave. And this person decided to retire. And they asked Phil, would you interview for this position? So I became someone who was just some guy with some resume on a piece of paper. They didn't know who I was to someone they knew, they knew my work, they knew my personality, and I became the inside candidate. It was basically my job. And many people applied, but they already decided who they're going to hire. Because you're gonna find out that as you start going to work, uh, you spend more time with the people that you work with than your family. Like I spend more time with my good friend, Edwin, my cap director, than with my family. And he, you know, bless his soul, um, every time this budget session, he's in there, to like four in the morning, literally from 9 a.m. to four in the morning. So uh, you spend a lot of time at work and the people that you work with, uh, hopefully are people that you like to just hang out with. If you don't like their personalities, it's not fun. So I applied, I interviewed, I got hired and I went from someone who got paid $8 an hour to someone who was in charge of the health department the public health department, the mental health department, the homeless policy, uh, the biggest departments in LA County with the largest budgets. And I went from $8 an hour to $80,000 an hour, which for me was a huge jump, obviously. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm flowing with cash. You know, like I never had so much money in my life. And I was able to do what I love. So I think most of us wanna do what we love uh, we want a career. We don't want a job. And you are doing the things that are necessary to get to where you want to go to achieve those dreams. So I, I'm very proud of each and every one of you. Um, and to make a, a long story a bit shorter, because I want to open up for questions, and you can ask me any question you want. You can be as direct as you want. Um, that afforded me an entire world. For the next 10 years of my life, I, I worked for LA County Supervisor Mike Antonovich, the county mayor, and I had an opportunity to become a reserve deputy sheriff. Um, I had an opportunity to become a school board member for Walnut Valley Unified School District. And then uh, in 2014, I had the opportunity to run for assembly. So the assembly um, in my district covers LA County, Orange County, and San Bernardino County and the legislature are in charge of approving your state budget, which is $200 billion. Uh, California is the fifth largest economy in the world. In fact, there's only four other countries that have a larger budget than just the state of California. And that's Germany, Japan, China, and the United States. Every other country in the world 
the United Kingdom, uh, Canada, uh, Mexico, they have smaller budgets than just our state. California is a country unto itself. Well, in 2014, there was an opening for the assembly, this area. And I felt that <clears throat> all the things I sacrificed for was for this purpose, to run for state assembly. And I knew it was my destiny to run and to win. So we ran, we raised the most money for any candidate, regardless of party affiliation, Democrat and Republican, in that year in 2014 in the primary. Uh, we raised close to $800,000 in the, in, the, in the primary. We had over 400 volunteers. And I w went to the campaign office at election night and deep in my heart, I felt we're gonna win this. It was my destiny to make a change and make a difference to implement policy in the state of California. Then usually during election night, you'll see on the screen, we have this huge kind of like movie projector, the returns. So nine o'clock hits, the first returns come in and all the counties come out with the vote tally. The vote comes in and lo and behold, my vote count was down. I'm like, oh, that's weird. I'm a couple hundred votes down, but maybe we'll make it up. Half an hour later, second tally, my vote counts down. Third tally, my vote counts down. And it got to a point where like, okay, I'm gonna lose. And it felt like going to my own funeral. I felt like going to my own funeral, yet everyone was crying and I'm the one who had to comfort them. And I felt horrible. Um, I didn't feel as bad about me per se, about me losing, but all these people that believed in me, whether they were in high school, your age, the people that were 98 or 88, uh, helping me walk precincts, make phone calls, um, phone bank and raise money for me, I felt I let them down. And I remember specifically one of my volunteers who was in high school was crying and was like apologizing. I was saying, Phil, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry we lost. And I had to comfort her and say, it's okay. This is nothing but the first step for success and we're gonna do better. And this will be a great lesson for us. But the truth is I wanted to crawl in the hole and go in the back and not talk to anyone. But I can't tell you how profound and important it was for me because when you win, oftentimes you think that you did everything right. But the truth is you could have been lucky and external forces could have helped you to succeed. When you lose, you kind of have to go back to the drawing board and it gives you an opportunity to reevaluate what you did right, what you did wrong, how you could have done better. So that's what I did. I went back to the drawing board. So I went back to the drawing board and uh, I thought my life in politics was over. And lo and behold, in 2016, the person who beat me decided to run for state Senate and open up the assembly position again. I ran and I won. And uh, it's been a wonderful experience to kind of live out my, my dreams and to do the best I can for the district that I grew up in. And just to make it clear, uh, my district has three counties, uh, Los Angeles County, and that's Walnut, Diamond Bar, Roland Heights, 30% uh, of West Covina, parts of City of Industry in the City of Covina, and San Bernardino County, Chino Hills. And finally, 60% of my district is in Orange County, and that's Brea, La Habra, Placentia, and Yerba Linda. So I've been in office since 2016. This is my third term. Uh, in the legislature, in the assembly, you have uh, six terms, two years each. You run every two years, and you have a total of 12 years. Um, we are um, based on uh, parliament in England, right? They have the House of Commons, the House of Lords. And if you ever come to Sacramento, I'll make sure to give you the, the, the grand tour. Uh, in the assembly, it's a green carpet and the parliament in England, the House of Commons is a green carpet. The House of Lords has a red carpet. And in the state, state Senate, they have a red carpet. And we are also modeled based on the federal system. So our Congress members are like us, the assembly members, right? We have two-year terms. Assembly and Congress are, 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 are you know, lower house. It, it's not like lower or upper. We all have the same powers and votes. We just cover uh, overlapping regions. The state senators are like our US senators, right? And then the uh, governor is like the president, part of the executive branch. So in order to get anything passed in the state of California legislatively, 
Um, if it comes from the Senate, they have to pass their house. Then it comes to our house in the assembly. And then if it passes our house, it goes to the governor. Same thing with our side. Um, if we have a bill coming from our house in the assembly, it has to pass our house first with all the votes. And there's 80 of us. That means you have to have 41 votes. Then after you get 41 votes or over, it goes to the state Senate. In the state Senate, there's 40 uh, state senators that represent the state of California. And you need a minimum of 21 votes. And then finally it goes to the governor. And that's the same thing on the federal level. So they're bigger in Congress. There's over 400 members uh, in the US Senate. Uh, they're bigger as well. However, it's the same type of methodology. And the thing is, you're going to find out that a lot of things in life, they're very similar. It's just a different pond. So when I was in Cal State Fullerton, being part of student government was a good reflection of how politics was in the quote unquote real world, right? For me to run for office. And then being on school board and running that campaign was just a smaller version of what I had to do for assembly. And then once you go to the assembly, you know, you have to deal with the same type of situations in terms of um, interactions, right? So I like to say it's three Ps. Um, and that helped me in all different values of life. You have to learn the politics, the policy, and the procedure. Politics, policy, procedure, these three Ps. And these three Ps, you had to learn them from me when I was in college, in student government, when I was in school board, when I was a health deputy for LA County Mayor Mike Antonovich, to now be in the assembly. So uh, those things are, are universal. So with that, I'm gonna kind of uh, take a, a little breather so I can uh, just have you guys ask any questions you want, because I've been doing a lot of jibber jabber. So any question that you have, um, ask away. There is no question that is taboo. Um, there is no question that is too direct. So I wanna be um, as open with you as I possibly can. So feel free to ask away. So with that, I'll, I'll just open up for questions. Thank you so much, Assemblyman, for sharing your story. So I'd like to get into the first topic, which is uh, before you became an assemblyman, you were a school board, school board trustee. So since being a school board trustee is a little bit different than uh, being a state assemblyman, the question I wanted to ask you is, what made you want to change from being a school board member to running for state assembly? Um, thank you so much for that question, Ryan. And please call me Phil. Uh, you don't have to call me assembly uh, member. Thank you so much, I, I Phil. Appreciate that. Oh yeah, just call me Phil, no worries. I, I appreciate your time. We're all friends here. Um, you know, school board was a great opportunity for me. And um, sometimes you think of politics to be very linear and, oh, I have to go from city council, or school board to city council, city council to assembly or in the Congress and yada, yada for more uh, influence or more power or more public policy decisions. But being on school board is the most influential position for the school district, for the two cities of Walnut and more. My background was in education, I taught. So that was an area that was very uh, of interest to me. Uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't have, um, I mean, I, I am very interested in K through 12 education policy, um, but I also thought that going from school board to um, assembly, I could influence even more because in the school district, 90% um, of the budget comes from the state. Right? It, it's not coming from uh, the school itself, right? meaning that all the funding, the major sources of funding are uh, for people sitting in your seats, attendance rates, right? number of students. Right? Some of it could be um, free and reduced lunch if there's a need for a school district to get funding for an at-risk youth, they'll get funding from the state or federal government, but it's all external influences. And that puts school districts at a disadvantage because it's not like a business where if I make more money, I know how much my budget is gonna be for this year. All their funding is based on external influences which they have no control over. So every year we were scrambling. So I thought it was a good opportunity for me to get involved on education policy on the state level and also to support a district that I really care about. Thanks for that question, Ryan, it's a great question. Thank you, uh, Phil. I just wanted to ask you um, about your political background. I know that in the state assembly, they consider it to be a democratic supermajority. So I wanted to ask, um, in what ways do you work with your colleagues across the aisle 
to pass legislation, for example, and do you ever find it difficult to do so? Nick, that's a great question. You guys are asking super good questions. So I'm very impressed. Uh, you're asking better questions than most reporters, so good for you. Um, that is true. So what Nick means is in the assembly and also in the state Senate, there is a larger proportion of Democrats to Republicans. Uh, if you wanna block a, a vote like a tax increase, which is more of a, um, a heavy vote, you need to have a two thirds um, to block it. Right? And right now we don't have that two thirds. So there's only 20 Republicans in the state assembly out of 80. So 60 year Democrats and you only need 41 votes to pass a bill, right? So yes, I, I do find it more difficult. I do find it more difficult to be Republican but it's also up to you as an elected official or a candidate to work with your friends across the other aisle. So I myself, I'm, I like to consider myself a kind of centrist. Uh, socially, I'm, I, I'm liberal. Uh, fiscally, I'm conservative in the sense of I don't like to spend money that we don't have. And I think, I believe that the majority of Californians have that similar type of ideology, right? They, uh, they don't care about what a person does in their own free time as long as, long as they don't impact one another. But I think they care about um, the fiscal solvency of the state budget. So what I have done, I've tried to do, and it's also my personality is one, I don't go into Twitter wars. Uh, I don't uh, follow maybe President Trump's brand of politics where you know you tweet to Taylor Swift or what have you. Like, I don't do Twitter wars. I don't throw bombs. Um, I don't get into social media negative campaigning, right? I, I don't get into that sort of stuff. What I do though is I go to as many democratic events as I possibly can. I become friends with them and I see if there's areas that we can work on issues together. It's very easy to divide one another. And I think as human beings, we are evolved in the sense of our science. However, psychologically and emotionally, we're like monkeys. So, <laughs> Emotionally, uh, we're like chimpanzees, except we have the codes to nuclear warheads. And we have the ability to push that button. Meaning if someone hurts you, you punch them back, right? It's very kind of reptilian ring. So instead of, of looking at ways in which it divides us, I look at ways in which unites us. So if there's a Democrat, maybe they're from a district that is like Buffy Wicks. Someone from Buffy Wicks represents Oakland. She's extremely progressive, um, but we're friends. We go and have coffee. Um, Dr. Bill Quirk, another Democrat. Evan Lowe, another Democrat. All these are policy-wise could be more left of me, but I find common ground and find ways we can work on stuff together. And I think that's the only way Republican can survive in the legislature. In addition to uh, bills, like we'll write bills and we'll say, hey, this is our idea. We'll give it to a Democrat. Why don't you run the bill? I don't have to put my name on it and you can get the credit. So Reagan said that there's no amount of things that you can't do if you don't mind not getting the credit. You know, for me, as long as it passes, right? And as it passes, I think it does a, a better interest for the Californians um, as opposed to me getting credit because just because there's an R next to my name, there's a lot of negative connotations, right? And sometimes they don't want a Republican to get a win, which is okay, um, but you have to be a lot more creative of how you campaign, how you conduct yourself in the assembly, as well as um, how you reach out and you have to be proactive in that. Um, that's something that I think um, is um, uh, what we've done pretty well in the state assembly. Great question, Nick. Thank you for your answer, Philip, or Phil, I'm sorry. Um, so many students are focused on academics, clubs, extracurriculars to get into the university of their choice. And, you know, in, in such a competitive environment, this is like expected of you. So, um, you know, often they're distracted from other important things, like maybe their interests or what they want to do, you know, how they want to prepare for their future in other ways. So um, my question is, you know, what's your advice to students who want to, you know, you did some really amazing things in college and you did, you connected with some uh, really great people. So what's your advice to students who, you know, wanna do the same thing and want to maybe, um, you know, spread their wings and find other ways to uh, prepare for their futures? That's such a great question, Connor, and I really appreciate that. Um, you know, as you apply for college, it's, you know, five criteria. It used to be SATs, which, you know, this year they got rid of, and it looks like it's gonna be, um, 
no longer something that is part of the grading criteria, but certainly GPA is a big thing, the personal statement. If you're going to a private university, it's potentially three letters of rec. And finally, as you said, Connor, uh, extracurricular, and that could be sports, leadership, uh, volunteering. Uh, what I say is, what I think is, is this. Um, for my parents, education was a silver bullet for success. And I think um, it's so ingrained in us that we have to succeed and do well. And there's so much pressure for each and every one of you, for Ryan, for Nick, for Connor, for Ashton, so much pressure at such a young age now that you have to perform. You have to be the best in academics. A 4.0 is not even good enough anymore. My gosh, a perfect 1600 SAT score. You have to like volunteer, you know, 20 hours a week at least. You have to be good at sports. You have to play an instrument. It's so competitive and it's so ingrained in our DNA now that you have to succeed, that you have to do well, and that a ordinary life is not good enough. So what I say is, in my opinion, you should pursue your passions. You should go out and reach for the stars and do what you have to do to be happy and fulfilled. But it shouldn't be at the cost of your own contentment and happiness. It shouldn't be the cost that will deprive you of inner happiness. Um, and I say that because um, one of the things that I think is um, extremely difficult in our society right now as a meritocracy is that we think that the people that succeed deserve to succeed. And based on the ideology, um, the people that don't do as well deserve that. And that's not necessarily the case. I will say that 95%, you know, put whatever number you want, of the things that happen right now in your life are completely out of your control. How come you're at Walnut High School? How come you guys were born men? How come you guys are of your same ethnicity? Why are you born in the United States? Why is Philip Chen not in some Chinese rural village, you know, being a, a pig farmer, you know, out of my control, right? I couldn't control who I was going to be born to, my parents, the, all these things. So I th think that you should experience whatever you should experience. Go out there. If one day you want to go and right now you want to learn how to draw, go, do it. You want to go into politics, do an internship, see how it's like. And if you do that internship, you're like, this is not for me, like medicine wasn't for me, then that's great too. You know why? Because the lessons you learn from that, it will always be part of you, Connor. And two, you don't go down a path like 30 years from now, you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't like politics. At least you know firsthand what it is. Um, but to um, search for what you want to do and to focus on intrinsic interests, not for the title, not for the car, not for the money, do something that makes you fulfilled. Um, and also, you know, your, your, your parents and I understand they love you, but they want you to go to Harvard and they want you to go to Yale, right? And I don't blame them. Those are great schools. But when you do apply for the schools, as opposed to um, applying for a school with the best name, visit the schools. Try to go to the school that I think is the best fit for yourself. So there's some uh, schools, you know, liberal art, art schools or private schools that are smaller. Maybe the class size is 20 to, uh, you know, 20 to one, you know, one professor for every 20 students or you know, one professor for every 30 or, or 40. Well, as opposed to a larger university, like UC Berkeley is awesome, but um, it, the school size is bigger. Um, the student to professor ratio is also bigger. So find what's best for you. Maybe that is the best fit for you. Right? So I encourage you to go out, to embrace the struggle. I encourage you to go out and fall. But when you fall, fall looking up so you can stand up, right? And during that fall, during that process, those lessons are critically, critically important for your life. Um, success is subjective. I don't necessarily feel a person who has money uh, or a person who has influence or power is successful, right? Successful is a person who is happy, right? Who can do what you want, when you want, how you want, right? So I have a, a good friend, <laughs> he's known, I mean, he actually has a business in the Walnut area. And uh, if you just Google, you know, I'm not going to say his name, but <laughs> he's got like 50 Ferraris, 
50 Ferrari. He's a very wealthy guy and he's a great guy. He's a philanthropist. But for me, uh, a person with one Ferrari is a person who needs a hug because, you know, money um, and cars and influence, uh, these things are in our society, which um, are not things that we inherently need, right? It's are things in which um, are utilized as a way to get people to look at them in a certain way. Like, oh, that guy has money. I got to treat them better. They're looking for respect or love, you know? And I think ultimately you got to find something that um, you feel that you can contribute to society, whatever it is, even if it's, you know, sideboard chalk drawings, whatever it is, a poet, whatever it is, just do the best you can with what you got for what drives you. So thank you for that question, Connor. I appreciate it. Serving as assembly man for the 55th assembly district, you surely have had many visions and plans for how you can better it, probably even since the start of your political career. Therefore, I wanted to ask you on how you view your role as an assemblyman and what things do you think you can do to make the community better? I also want to ask how do you think individuals themselves, such as students, volunteers, anyone can make the community better as well? How could they become the best them they could be? And also, I want to ask, what ways do you think that they could improve, like their chances, for example? Um, Ashton, thank you so much for that, that question. Um, it's a great question. It's got uh, multiple facets to that. Um, so certainly, I know you did a lot of thinking in regards to that. Well, um, I feel it's a privilege to serve in the state assembly. And uh, for those that are in politics, uh, we are renters. We're not owners. Even the president of the United States can only serve a total of two terms of eight years total, right? If they win re-election. And in the assembly, um, the most I can serve is 12 years. But every two years, I have to quote unquote, renew my contract with the voters. And if they deem that I am not a fit for the district, they vote me out. And that includes, of course, the governor of California. And it's a true privilege. And one of the things that I really enjoy, and I'm very lucky to be able to work with my team, uh, including uh, Edwin, is uh, we're a system navigator. There's a lot of folks that they need issues with their EDD, or they have an, a problem with the DMV. The DMV is probably one of the worst places you want to be uh, when you need an issue with your driver's license, but that's the only place you can go to. And some of these people, they call department to department. They don't get an answer. They get answering machines. But if you call our office, we will do our very best to give you that Nordstrom service. Uh, we'll give you our contact information. I'll give you my cell phone. And uh, sometimes it may not be the answer you want, but there will be a live person from our office representing you because you elect us into office. If it wasn't for the votes of the voters, and their support, we wouldn't be where we were uh, and are in the legislature. So that is a certain level of response that I think uh, sometimes bureaucrats don't have. So being a system aggregator is very important for us. And sometimes it could be as simple as a driver's license renewal or what number to call to um, get their son into the right hospital. And sometimes it could be uh, major issues with mental health or finding a place for them to reside for a night if they're homeless. Um, the things that we work on, the policies are uh, very diverse. Um, it could be from A to the assessor to Z to zoning. It's very diverse in what we have to work with. So I, I really enjoy being a system navigator. So sometimes and oftentimes when they come to us as a constituent, we are their, the last person in their last hope because they are fed up because they've gone from place to place to place. They don't have an answer and they finally come to us. So. We usually, uh, if it's a bigger issue, we can get them to the right person and get all these people in the same room with us to try to hash out and negotiate and come to a compromise, if you will. And for me, that is very special. When it comes to policy, um, like I said before, when I worked for County Mayor Mike Antonovich, I did health for him and public health and mental health and homeless issues. So the area of mental health policy and homeless policy is of critical importance to me and is near and dear to my heart. Um, in California, we are a very expensive state to live in. We have the highest sales tax, highest gas tax, highest state income tax. We also, on the flip side of that, 
have the highest levels of homelessness. Nearly half of the country's homeless population is in our state. And that to me is a travesty that we are in a first world country, yet we have third world services for our residents. Um, and to me, one of the major issues of homelessness, if you've ever gone to Skid Row, um, they call it 10 city, they're there because that's where the services are. And one of the reasons that they're there is because I believe that co-occurring disorders, which means that they have a mental health issue, a drug and substance abuse issue, and sometimes an issue with their, their health, sometimes they need specialty services, are one of the reasons why they're homeless. Um, there is certainly a portion of the homeless population are there for economic, but many of the folks there, they choose to be there. When you say here, we want to find a place for you to get treatment, for drug treatment, for mental health treatment, they refuse services. It's very common. They choose to live there because that's how they self-medicate. Oftentimes they're bipolar schizophrenic and they self-medicate with alcohol or drugs, or sometimes it's vice versa. They start with being a drug addict and they have a mental health psychotic episode and they choose to be living on the streets. And one of the issues is we cannot mandate treatment if they're over 18. Under 18, your parents or the government can mandate treatment. If you're over 18, the only time we can say, we're gonna force treatment and give you treatment because you have a psychotic episode, um, you're bipolar, schizophrenic, whatever it may be. The only time we can do that is if you're 5150, meaning that you're a danger to yourself or a danger to others, meaning that you, you hurt yourself or you hurt someone else, then we can mandate treatment, but only for a certain period of time. 24 hours, 48, 72, max two weeks. So I believe that when you see a person that's homeless and they're mentally ill, and I, you know, you see them even, even in Walnut, and they're talking to themselves and they're out in the rain, especially now in 30 degree weather, I think it is inhumane that we don't give them treatment. I think it's inhumane that we don't give them housing and treatment for their addiction or mental health because they can't fend for themselves. Their own parents, if they have parents or family members cannot force treatment upon them because they are an adult and over 18. So I'll, I'll give this quick example. Uh, Richard Alicorn, who used to be part of the state legislature. Um, clearly he's, you know, as a politician, he had influence, uh, he had money. His son, uh, as we speak, is homeless walking the streets of LA. He's an adult and he can't force treatment upon him. And the person, his son will um, oftentimes go into county jail because he will hurt himself, hurt someone else. And then he stays there and then he comes back out again. And arguably LA County jail system is the largest mental health treatment center in the country, which is a worse place to get treatment, right? That's not a place where you'll get better, right? Um, but if we can't have policies and laws that have uh, a mandated mental health treatment system for our chronically homeless, to me, that is a travesty. So that's, that's a policy I'm working on. So thanks for that question, Ashton. Any uh, other questions? Um, I think that's it, but thank you so much, Phil, for joining us today and accepting our invitation and giving us just great advice. I think we all really appreciate it. And we're really grateful to have, have had you join us today. Well, I'm super proud of, of each and every one of you. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity to talk to you and kind of share my story and share some of uh, uh, my thoughts. Um, consider me a friend. I will always be an ally on your side, uh, whether it's as simple as a letter of recommendation or an internship, but I'm so grateful for the opportunity. I'm gonna give you my uh, email, my cell, um, and when you apply for college or if you're looking for an internship in our district office, so I have a district office in Brea and then Edwin's in our Sacramento office. Monday through Thursday, I'm in Sacramento usually, nine months a year. And then Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I'm back in the district. But we have uh, a team members in Brea as well as in Sacramento. The Brea office is off the 57 freeway in the city of Brea, not that far from the Brea Mall. And if you pass by the 57, there is a... Um, Soup plantation, it's closed now, but we're right next to that soup plantation. Mm -hmm. Not that far from Walnut, probably 20 minutes. Um, you're welcome there anytime. Um, but here's my contact info. Um, 
It's a 909-714-0578. Connor is very considerate of you. <laughs> and my email is uh, Philip Chen. That's P H I. L L I P C H E N 78 at gmail.com. So again, it's Philip Chen 78 at gmail.com. So for you and the other students, if they ever just want to talk or learn more about the political process or do an internship through Letter Reg, happy to support them. But I'm very, very proud of you guys. Um, if I was in high school uh, doing what you do, I think my life would have been easier uh, as opposed to uh, getting kicked out of high school. So what you guys are doing right now, um, you will lead to a tremendous path in the future. And I'm going to be looking at your future with keen interest because I know you guys will do very, very well. So kudos to you. And of course, I uh, want to thank uh, my cap director, Edwin, for facilitating this. And please feel free to reach out to him as well. He's got a great story um, and he's um, done so many great things here in Sacramento. So thank you. Thank you, Phil. And thank you, Edwin. We really appreciate the yeah. opportunity to talk. Thank, thank you. you for your time. Thank you. You guys take care, okay? You, you too. too. Right. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you to the both of you. Take care.